Vallejos is a, a frequent presenter and speaker at industry and community functions. Over the past two decades, Rico has been helping Fortune 500 companies with their multicultural marketing communications and corporate communication needs. Drawing from his experience working in Europe, Latin America, and across the United States, he presents strategies for success when targeting and working with the new immigrant communities in America. Rico's media experiences include founding and serving as editor-in-chief of La Voz de la Plaza, a national Verizon publication, and co-founding La Voz Latina, a Minnesota publication. He served on editorial advisory board of Mark Magazine, a Star Tribute a publication, and La Presa de Minnesota. He's also been involved at the, uh, at the University of St. Thomas and a trustee emeritus at Hamlin University. So without further ado, how about a hand for Rico Vallejos? Thank you. Hi, Rico. Hello. Thank you, Rick. And uh, just a housekeeping note for other speakers, this is a touch screen, so it moves around. <laughs> if you, you know, the paper can be touching it. First, I want to uh, bring your attention to that wall, on that, that, that wall clock there. Isn't that a minimalist? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a conversational piece, you know? It's like, wow. I like it. So I think it's keeping the right time. So I'll try to, to speed up my presentation so we can, we can catch up on the, you know, do the panel discussion on time. So let's, uh, let me open my PowerPoint and I will be helping with uh, AV for everybody else. Rico Latino, here we go. Oh, thank you. Somebody contributed a nice piece of technology to this. <laughs> and I have a laser pointer here, so I might as well use it. <laughs> 2017. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a creative director. I work with media planners, media people, so I don't always do a media plan, but I consult and help. Most of my work is national, not in Minnesota. Can you hear me okay? Am I too yeah. loud? No? Hi, Amalia. And uh, you can hear me okay? <laughs> can, you hear me? can you hear me now? So uh, I hope, is my accent okay? Am I too strong? I can make it stronger <laughs> or not. I, used to, I, I spent a lot of time in Minnesota, and I've been spent, I, the last seven years I've been mostly gone doing projects on the West Coast and uh, in Latin America. And so I tell people, I'm back in Minnesota now after seven seven, eight years of being gone, and I lost my Minnesota accent, you know? <laughs> I mean, that's how, how easy you can lose that. So, traditional media, digital media. Uh, we're going to cover this very quickly, uh, strategies and tactics. As you know, the media environment has changed drastically. Obviously, we've been talking for the last 20 years, really, about uh, it's no longer a one-way one, one communication, it's a dialogue. So you not only, you don't put an ad and an article through PR in a newspaper uh, or magazine, and then you reach them. It's a dialogue, and a lot of social has a lot to do with that. But anyway, let's move on with the broadcast. And uh, every, ev by the way, every media organization today has a digital component. So. Uh, you'll, you'll, have, you'll be hard pressed to find a radio station, a TV station, a TV network, a print publication that is not, don't, doesn't have a version online. And often the online version is uh, uh, a lot better, a lot more up to date, and a better value if you want to place an ad than the traditional, you know, printed version of it. So uh, we have a local version. Is Maya in the room? Maya, where are you? So Maya Santa Maria. Maya Santa Maria. Uh, it has the local, that's not her by the way, uh, has, her, has the local uni, uh, Telemundo uh, station. We have two, there are two national sta sta you know, cable sta uh, stations, uh, broadcast TV stations in the country, Telemundo and Univision. We have local stations on both of those. And Maya Santa Maria runs Telemundo. Uh, this is Telemundo, Minnesota. That's it. Uh, El Canal Favorito de Minnesota, 
great online, great social. I don't think I have a, yep. This is um, uh, Telemundo as well. They have a lot, a very, very active, good social uh, media work. So they engage people, they have a bunch of followers. And um, Univision is the only other one. I didn't know that Maya was not going to be here because I had a ton of Univision slides and I thought, no. <laughs> I don't think I want to do that, too many of those. Univision is huge and Univision has uh, uh, over 60 local TV stations around the country. Uh, they do Univision Radio has a huge network um, of radio stations around the country and I can't wait for the day when Univision Radio comes to Minneapolis and, and uh, brings up the level of our broadcast and radio work a few notches up in Minneapolis. So, by the way, just talking about the local scene, like I said, most of my work is national, but of course I'm here, so I get to know people, I worked, I've written for many of the local publications. And back about 10 years ago or so, national, uh, Minnesota Public Radio did a story on, on Latino media in Minnesota. And uh, they interviewed me, and uh, they had a list of people. I said, oh yeah, you talk to all those people, talk to all these people too, and there were you know, several. They were, at the time, there were 14 print publications in Minnesota. So I recommend that you, know, you talk to them. And in just in talking, I, one of the things I said, which they ended up using as a clip in the ads for people to listen to the one hour document, radio documentary, <coughs> is a clip that I said, and that is one way to sum up Latino media in Minnesota is that there is a lot of media and very few journalists. <laughs> and uh, that's the reality, you know, it's a sad reality of, uh, of every emerging market. Every emerging market, the minority, the ethnic minorities come up with magazines, but it usually begins with an entrepreneur, somebody who is able to go to corporations and get them, get a few thousand dollars out of them to, to print, you know, to buy the back page and the front page and all these ads. And then you do wire service and you, you put the editorial that way. Over the years, several publications uh, have been very, very um, good at covering locals. And with my team back in the, you know, 2003 maybe, we did we, a big conference table. We opened all this, the latest version of all these 14 publications. And uh, some of the better ones, we have two people here represented that, that did Latino media. Adolfo Cardona. You had a magazine, a newspaper, Nuestra Gente, and others over the years that, uh, but you know, the, the uh, Lat uh, Midwest, Latino Midwest, great local coverage. It wasn't just a bunch of bunch of war service. Another photo of the American president and the Mexican president shaking hands, and and things about you know, something that happened in Texas, or it was relevant stuff for Latinos in Minnesota. And then uh, Miguel Ramos, who is now with the Twins, had a great, beautiful magazine called Vice Versa Magazine, Vice Versa Magazine. Bilingual, glossy, it was one of the most beautiful magazines I've seen, and I put, I put advertising there, I tried to steer clients there. But uh, there was a beautiful, uh, great publication with great content, graphically, editorially. So there have been several, like, other, other examples too. And, uh, but in general, that, that's the reality. So we have, in the local scene, you have to, you know, you have to understand who's who and what's happening and who has a real editorial team and who doesn't. So, I mean, I've seen some publications had a few journalists and then pretty soon there's nobody left and then you see a story written by one of the salespeople. So, <laughs> uh, I've seen that. And uh, so, Televisa is a huge, player in Mexico, but it's coming to the U.S. Televisa is doing a partnership with Univision, which is the other big, you know, the one we just talked about. And uh, they um, are doing a partnership on content. Telemundo traditionally has been better in, in portraying the reality of American Latinos. They may have bilingual shows. You know, you, have, you may see a show, say a sitcom, where the uh, parents speak Spanish, the kids speak English. It's a bilingual environment, a real environment of Latinos in the U.S. as opposed to some telenovela from Mexico that is, the, the setup is Mexico. So things are much more culturally relevant today. And uh, I want to mention a good friend of mine, uh, Mexican guy, friend of Rick's too, Carlitos. You know Carlitos, right? Yeah. 
Uh, Rick also knows him. Carlos Slim is uh, uh, today number six richest person in the world. The, the list just came out. And he owns a lot of media. He's uh, the largest shareholder of the New York Times. He owns 17% of the New York Times. And Carlos Slim is beginning, there he is, number six. Uh, it looks like uh, my friend Donaldo went down from 324 to 544. So number six, Carlos Slim is investing in Nuestra Visión. And he's selling, you know, if anybody's interested here to start broadcast, he's selling affiliates. You can sign up, and if you're interested in doing an affiliate somewhere in the country, in the U.S., he's bringing Televisa, he's bringing a lot of great uh, content for Latinos in the U.S., more for Mexicans in the U.S., actually. This is uh, directly Mexico. It's from Mexico, 100% authentic channel, <laughs> authentic food. And so that will be a new player that may revolutionize the potential is that this station, this new network, uh, reaching Mexicans specifically, will, will really have a huge impact in the U.S. Hispanic market at least. And by the way, in most of the country, you know, you go to New York, uh, to New York and Miami is a little different, but in most of the country, Mexicans are a majority. In the whole country, the Mexican population is about two-thirds of the Latino population are Mexican. And the, one, the, the other third is the rest of us who are not from Mexico. I'm from Argentina myself, but uh, there were a few of us. Most of us, non-Mexicans in the U.S., like I said, the, the exception could be maybe New York or Miami, are Mexicanized to a great degree. And when something like this comes, we're going to watch it. We understand Mexican culture. We understand Mexican jokes. We know Mexican food. We are Mexicanized because that's the majority culture around us in the Latino community. So we can be from Colombia, we can be from Chile, from Puerto Rico even, and you have a knowledge and a familiarity and an appreciation of Mexican culture that people in your home country don't. My family in Argentina knows nothing about Mexico or Mexican culture, but it's second nature to me. I, I know because of spending time in Mexico, but also spending time in Latino markets in the U.S., and living in an environment where I'm sure, you know, most of my colleagues in Hispanic marketing are Mexican. So, so moving with print again, we have, this is not dead by the way, print still is a very important, and we have several here, that's my, this is my, my little, my props, bunch of magazines, you can go to the burrito across the street in this, in this building, and see a lot of these great Latino publications. Oh, and I'm showing Shail. Uh, we have great Latino publications. There are several of them, actually, that are quite, um, quite uh, um, active in the community, and you do reach people there. And if not, if not with, um, if not with uh, the, the actual print publication, which is a nice vehicle, they, all, they are better and better being online, being on social, so it's a great way to get the word out among Latinos. Not to say that there are all the kinds of ways. El Diario, this is national. Nationally, you have some great, huge La Opinión in LA, and they have a network now around the country. Uh, it's, you know, you can do media buys, by the way. If you are doing any kind of national work, you can do some specific um, buys to, to target regional, that's Florida, Central Florida, increasingly Puerto Rican, Vida Sabor is local here, and um, Chicago is one of the huge Latino markets. So if your company or whatever you're doing is increasingly digital, then the whole country is your market. You know, you don't have to, of course, restrict yourself to Florida, El Nuevo Herald, El Nuevo, El Nuevo Herald. That's what we say it in Spanish, El Nuevo Herald. And um, these, these and many more are successful, current. You go to the site, you get the print version uh, when you're in those locations, and uh, they really uh, uh, have relevant, relevant, interesting content. So these tons, magazines, online magazines, the bottom line is, when it comes to, you know, this is all Hispanic, by the way, I'm just focusing on Hispanic at this point. 
it's really um, a huge opportunity to get to people. The question is to do uh, the planning. We're going to do Q&A when we wrap it up. So content marketing, and this is, this is what's changed over the last 10 years especially, hugely, that the brand is the publisher. So you don't just put a website. What is a website today? It's not a brochure of your company or your organization. It's a publication that want, you want people to consume. You want to publish relevant stuff there and then um, put it on social so people you know, point to your blog, to your articles, to your content on, the, on your website. Organizations began new, they get a new URL and they start a new website. So these are some examples of uh, content marketing. By the way, these are very, very new, you know, within the last month or two, articles everywhere, all these business magazines about how to get a hold of your content marketing. Because now the, the, the whole concept of content marketing is reaching a little bit maturity. Uh, it's still relatively new when you, when you think of how people approach it. So, Que Rica Vida, talking about General Mills, I've actually you know, done quite a bit of work with Que Rica Vida, which is the General Mills uh, outreach to Latinos. So I've written scripts and content, and um, they have famous chefs, and they really target bilingual Latinos. A lot of it is in Spanish, and it began in Spanish, but it's really a bilingual effort right now. So, and they are very, very uh, active on social. That's the Spanish version of the same thing. And uh, there are organizations, the Captura Group is one organization that helps companies with uh, content marketing. And, uh, and then social is how you get people to read what you want. That, that's one of my favorite quotes from Oscar Wilde. What's the point of doing great content and a great content marketing and you have an amazing website and you have a few other things and a, a cool blog and nobody's reading it. And uh, so you amplify things through social, through influencer marketing and uh, all of this, by the way, with ethnic communications, it's uh, very feasible and it's very well developed now. Still growing, like I said, but uh, uh, these are, you know, these are Facebook pages that have a lot of followers and they have regular new content, great content in, in uh, this town. Maria Isa, Maria Isa, anybody know Maria Isa here? Yes, okay, she is a local hero. And, uh, and she actually has gotten so much national attention uh, even recently. So she's a, she's a national caliber local is Al Justiniano here now? Did he make it yet? Okay. Teatro del Pueblo, great local theater group in Minnesota. And so these are organizations, by the way, through which you can, act, you can reach the community. You can partner with them. Most of, when you say, I want to buy some media today, you really are buying a relationship. And typically, today's media buy buys some event marketing, it buys social, buys digital content, all of it is combined into one relationship with a, with a media organization or with a community organization. So all these are organizations, except for the government, this is the government, the Minnesota Council on Latino Affairs, is to be CLAC, and, uh, and then Rico Latino, that's a, a cool site. A cool, a, a cool uh, <laughs> Facebook page, if I may say so myself. So, who are we trying to reach? And uh, the, the hot word is millennials, millennials, we all want millennials. Okay, great. Let's reach millennials. Most of my clients, by the way, are reaching millennials. Most of my work for the past five years has been a focus on millennials. And, uh, you know, over five years now that you look at the demographics, eh, the millennials are going to be a bigger generation than the baby boomers. So, and um, uh, there are many reasons why millennials are uh, a worthy target. You know, you can shoot there and then you get all kinds of other attention. But as opinion leaders, as uh, trendsetters, as the people, if depending on depending what kind of products you sell, they are the sweet spot.
If you sell cereals, well, they're the ones having babies, you know, having families. They are in the family formation age. And so, and they are everywhere. They are everywhere with all kinds of screens in their lives. And uh, when you think of millennials, and by the way, I've been involved with clients where we target what I call the bilennials, bilingual, bicultural, Hispanic millennials. Uh, which is a micro market within the whole millennial thing. But look at minority in general. When you look at millennials nationwide, one out of four is a Latino or Latina. The other fourth, the other person, you know, almost 50% uh, almost really is uh, African American, Asian, other ethnicity, other immigrant group. So half the millennial market is multicultural. The other half, likes it multicultural. When I served on the Board of Trustees at Hamlin University, I served on the Academic and Student Affairs Committee, the whole, my whole tenure besides other committees. And the one thing, then I, that got me a lot closer to deans of students, not only Hamlin's but others, and the reality of higher education today in terms of recruitment. And guess what? This is, we've been talking, this is being, this was happening back in 2003, college kids, 18 year olds in 2003. And I, I served 2003 to 2012. During that whole time, the reality is a college student comes into college and they look around and they say, I'm white of German descent and all the faculty I see uh, speaking and, and everybody around us, around us seems to be my same ethnicity. I want diversity. So the other half of the millennials says, I want diversity. I don't want to be an all white, or everybody like me environment. I, I, so schools have a hard time, and there are students who actually began to have conversations with their parents, saying, ma'am, dad, you know, I, I want to transfer. I checked out this other college, you know, I should have gone there actually, because they have a much more diverse student body. And so that is a, a, a desire that millennials have. And so therefore, the whole millennial market is a multicultural market. And in some ways, when we say, marketing, then we need to be saying multicultural marketing. Uh, it's no longer just focusing on ethnic. It's not only just focusing on Hispanic. And you know, don't get me going about Hispanic. A, transla a translation is not marketing. You know, you don't translate, it's not the language only, you know. If you're saying, oh, we're going to reach African Amer the African American market, well, African-American, many, many African-Americans don't consider themselves African-Americans because they were born in Africa, and so they are African living in America. And uh, we're going to hear more about that. 42% multicultural, technically, around the country. Minnesota is a little bit less. And um, 75, out of 75 million millennials in the US, 19 million are Hispanic, 12 African-American, by the way, um, my email address is on the Q&A at the end of all of this, and I, I'll be more than glad to email you some, you know, this deck uh, if you're interested. So, uh, 4.5 million Asian American. A lot of micro markets need to target, for example, the highly educated, highly affluent uh, Asian Indian population. A lot of them work in IT, others they work in, in technology. But there are specific immigrant groups that uh, a lot of people are not targeting. And there are ways to target a lot of these ethnic groups. So we have three huge, huge groups, African-American, Asian-American, Hispanic. But each one has many micro markets. And we're all, not all the same, by the way. So uh, understanding who we are reaching. Uh, when one project I did for Verizon for many years, including La Voz de la Plaza, the magazine, we were targeting a 30-year-old woman. We had a name for her, and uh, she was a mom. She had at least one kid in the home. She was married. So all those things, you know, she lived in a single family unit, not a condo or a, you know. You start to develop the persona very specifically, and then you reach that one person with the effect that you're reaching. That's the heart, the center of who you're looking for. So developing the persona is important. And within all of those, where were they born? If outside the U.S., how old were they when they came to the U.S.? In the Hispanic market and the other uh, um, immigrant markets, we talk about generation 1.5, generation 2, 3, 
My daughter, for example, was born in the U.S. She's generation two, second generation. We're talking about um, uh, immigrant generation. So I'm generation one. I'm first generation because I grew up outside of the U.S., believe it or not. And uh, my daughter is generation two. Somebody who comes with their parents at the age of ideally 10 before middle school, that's 1.5 because they are speak this typically they would know the norms and cultural norms and language of the country of birth and they went through a lot of uh, early or all uh, elementary education in that society come to the US they do high school they do college their primary language at the age of 25 when they get to be a millennial 18 to 35 they, they're primary English speakers the primary Americans yet they lived a good chunk of their lives, you know, elsewhere or in a family of immigrants. So it's a different, you know, so there are different techniques that you use. Are we targeting a 1.5 and 2? Are we targeting 3 plus? Those are the basic groups. Generation 1, 1.5, 2, 3 plus. So there are four uh, ethnicities. Some organizations so use a five, uh, a five way to segment. And they actually segment people by ethnicity. So they have levels of Latinicity, Asianicity, and so on. Um, in fact, I should have a deck, uh, something from them here. I don't, but uh, they're called uh, Geoscape, and they're in Florida. So, multicultural millennials, key trends, education. Okay, these are, when we think about the multiculturals, especially, most of them are generation 1.5 and 2, and 3 plus, of course. Many of them were born in the U.S. Uh, and their parents and grandparents and so on. Education, in many cases, they are the first generation to be a college graduate. Very gross generalization, but it's a, it's a safe, from a market, marketing point of view, a safe generalization. They are the first generation to, to graduate from college. They are uh, making a lot more money than their, their parents, and uh, they are the first generation being professionals, having a professional job, and uh, they're highly technological in the Latino market, like I said. By the way, even when you look at the millennial market alone, uh, Latinas, uh, Hispanic women have a much higher fertility rate than other millennials. So one, one uh, trend that you see among millennials is that they are postponing getting married, having babies, buying a house because of the student debt load that they have. And um, not so with Latinos, partly because they tend to carry a lower student debt overall, Latino millennials. And, uh, and partly because for cultural reasons, they tend to establish a relationship, maybe get married and have kids a lot earlier. The typical millennial is waiting longer and longer to get married, if ever, to have kids, if ever and uh, not so Latinos. So within all the groups in, uh, in the millennial uh, generation, uh, Latino, if you're looking for babies, look at, la look at uh, Latina. You know, come up with a persona. She's 30 years old, she's Latina, her name is Laura, you know, all those things. And, uh, but those, those trends are very important with uh, all minority cultures as a rule. Because now the minority is the majority, and you know, some part of, in some parts of the country, you know, you're depending on what kind of targeting you do. If you target children, sometimes almost half are Latinos, another third are other ethnicity, and, and, and then the white European is about a fourth. So, and uh, oh, fusion. Fusion was an attempt by Univision to create a channel for bilingual, bilingual, bicultural, Hispanic millennials. And uh, the market said, we don't want our own channel. <laughs> and so they, they really struggled. And Disney was part in it. Disney sold their ownership. Now it's all Univision back. And now they're, they're, they're moving. They had some layoffs late last year. And uh, Jorge Ramos, the, some of you may know the guy, he's a the anchor man for Univision News in Miami. Jorge Ramos uh, is one of the content people there. But uh, now they are basically targeting 
all millennials. And guess what? We're going to target all millennials because all millennials are multicultural. And either, either they are themselves or they appreciate and they want other cultures, other languages, international. By the way, I've seen that in my own client base. My, at one point, I remember seeing my own client base, people over 40, people under 40. People over 40 were more, much more likely, you know, clients in Minnesota, including. People over 40 tended to be monolingual, monocultural Americans. People under 40, increasingly, they were well-traveled. Uh, they, they spoke one or more languages. They spoke Chinese, they spoke some Japanese because they spent a year in Japan, in college. And they were much more likely to, to speak foreign languages, to have traveled the world at the ground level and, and you know, getting to know cultures. So it's a very, uh, uh, anytime you talk about millennials, you're talking about a very multicultural environment uh, from, the, from the value perspective. So native, anybody here doing native advertising? Yes? Okay, how's it working? Working okay? It, it's a work in progress. Yeah, work in progress, okay. exactly. <laughs> Sponsored content, paid posts, all those things. I've been trying to guide some clients on that. That's what it looks like. Anytime you see that, you know, okay, this is not done by, prof it's done by professional journalists, hopefully, <laughs> but, uh, but it's not true editorial content. Think of PR. What do we do? What do we buy in PR? You know, public relations professional, public relations agency will, in, you know, get a nice article written about your cause or company or brand uh, in the Star Tribune. So it gives you some credibility because the reader, okay, this is written, this is editorial content. I will believe that a lot better than I believe an ad. And so, and in fact, they calculate then the advertising value of what they got me. We got you so many column inches in the Star Tribune and we got so many articles in the digital version of this and that and whatever. And so uh, that's the PR, the world of PR. This is pseudo, you know, again, the brand as publisher because these are journalists, these are brand people, marketing people, people like me who are writers, who generate that kind of thing. And uh, it's actually quite, uh, look at this, New York Times. It says paid post, and then below that, Netflix, orange, is the new black. Anyway, it's an interesting article, well written, well done. And then it gets coverage. John Oliver has a great story on, on, uh, the, on native advertising because it's really blending news and advertising. And he doesn't like it. A lot of people don't like it. But guess what? It works better than a banner. When is the last, okay, anybody here clicked on a banner ad on their phone or computer in the last week? Intentionally, you know, maybe by mistake. Oops, oh, get out of there, get me out of there. Back, 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 back. <laughs> Intentionally. So, for better or for worse, we have native. And we're evolving. We are evolving. How do we get to people in a way that is not offensive, that's not deceiving? We buy banner ads, we do Facebook. So, and then the FTC has, uh, in December 2005, so now it's over a year, came up with very specific rules. Most companies in 2016, we decided, you know what? Most companies are not following the right rules. They are in trouble. If the FTC wants to start to enforce, we're in trouble, you know? And so it's an evolving, and the pioneers are doing it. And uh, I want to consider myself one of those, <laughs> taking the risk with my clients' budgets. And so we'll see, you know, we'll see what, um, what happens because it is a valid way to get messages out there and to get wide coverage. The question is, uh, how do we deal with it? And in fact, uh, what I, the first thing I do is go to the FTC rules. Each company, you know, anytime you have regulation when it comes to communication, anything really, packaging, North American packaging in Canada, you know, we do a lot of bilingual, uh, trilingual North American packaging. Each, each brand needs to decide how they're going to interpret the, the laws, the regulations, the labeling regulations, the disclosure regulations. And now we move to something that is somewhat similar because again, you pay, an you pay a blogger to blog about your brand, they need to disclose, you know. If Toyota gave them a car, oh, they gave me a car, they need to say that. 
uh, it's a great car, and they're going to do a review of the car, but if they get to keep the car, boy, they, they, they have to disclose that. So, uh, or if, even if they get a car to f use for free for a month, it's like, well, they need to say that. They need to disclose, they're paying me, you know. Uh, influencer is huge, and influencer is much more better developed than native at this point. So, uh, celebrity endorsement used to be the thing. Most consumers today don't really care uh, that George Clooney likes to shave with this, whatever, you know, whatever he does. Uh, it, it has less power than before. Even though it's still there, you know, people buy the Antonio Bandera things. And um, so all of this is influencer marketing. There's a lot of, uh, you know, why to explore it now? You know, this is, uh, the, we've been doing influencer marketing for several years. And companies are still hesitant to go and get into it. It's time to do it. And if you want to do ethnic marketing, huge, you know, influencers, that's what they call influencers. They, they have influence. People like them. They have a brand. They protect it. And of course, they disclose. They say, I, I want, I've been compensated by such a brand to do this, but all the opinions are mine. They're not paying me to say something I don't want to say. And then, and people trust that. So they have, you know, they, and they, they have a lot of blogger, in Spanish, we say la bloguera, el bloguero, you know, a lot of blogger conferences and en engagement. Every blogger out there hopefully has a lot of colleagues that they interact with. And you can hear the conversations they have. Brands have gatherings. Okay, let's get 20 bloggers that will blog for us or help us or understand what we do and we'll see. Some may say, that's not for me. I have my standards. Fine. You know, you're a vegetarian, we're selling beef you know, have to say, oh, this beef is great, even though I'm vegetarian, you know. So, uh, but uh, some of them will tell you, well, you know, the right formula is one in 10. You write 10 great articles and content your audience will love, and one of them is sponsored, you know, by somebody. Otherwise, it's just whatever I want, my, whatever my people want. I interact with them on Facebook and on Instagram, all over social media. So I know what they want. We have a great relationship. I have half a million of them, followers or whatever number. And so uh, th that's what some of them say, which to me sounds right. But I don't know what uh, the standard is today. Still evolving, but one in 10 sounds right. So if I follow this blogger because I love their attitude, they have cool stuff to say in whatever I like, uh, my hobby or profession or whatever. And one in 10 is a sponsored I still will pay attention, and I say, oh, this is pretty cool. And she goes, oh, this is really cool, you know, okay, I have to disclose that they paid me to do this, but man, all opinions are my own. Here we go. I'll read that, you know, and so that's real influence when, when you have so many, again, publishing. The brand, this is the brand as, as a, a publisher because I am the brand, I'm the publisher, I'm hiring this writer. See, he's a writer. I, as, a, as a magazine, as a, an editorial organization, I hire writers all the time, staff writers, freelance writers. Well, here's one freelance writer that I, write, that I hire a couple of times a year to do something. So the Gap uses it. It's all over the place. And, uh, and there are, it's, it's, a, it's a developed, um, uh, much more uh, developed uh, industry where you have organizations and groups of bloggers, blogueras, Latinas, you can go to them, work through them to select, okay, which ones? They gave me a, data, a spreadsheet with 50 bloggers and I choose which ones I want. Uh, I, look, I see how many followers they have on the various social uh, uh, media, uh, how many uh, people are on their database, email, where they sell this little newsletter. So these are organizations. We all grow Latina. This is a group of blogueras which is really great to work with. And uh, they, they really are, it's one, it's one of several organizations doing it right. So there are many more. And I'll be glad to send you this deck, this carousel is like an agency, but they, again, they connect you with, they have a great database of bloggers. And uh, a little bigger than that, carousel works you know, with a lot of brands. And, uh, Tap influence is really a way to automate a lot of this. If you have you're a larger brand, uh, you get to a lot of people and you go into their database of bloggers and see what the, what the metrics are. And then you say, okay, I'm going to try these 15 bloggers. 
with this program and, and, and there are very specific ways to work with them with bloggers in general so it's nice to go and you know you may just go to one or two and do it yourself or go through one of these services which are quite um, nicely covered so okay digital video and audio and then we're done latino you have to do audio you have to do video i love pandora latinos over and a lot of ethnic millennials but ethnic in general audiences over index in using online video online audio so uh, spotify is pretty good tons of latino content because they have tons of latino users and tons of users who enjoy latino things they may not be hispanic but they speak some spanish or they want to speak spanish and uh, they love latino culture maybe they're married to a latino or latina pandora uh, overall in the country uh, latinos way over index in uh, uh, pandora so we have oh am i going back i'm going back let's not regress so um, please jot down my email address we will be more than glad to email you this deck so you have this information and i believe i mentioned geoscape I can plug that into so that way you'll have that geoscape.com. They're in Florida. Q&A, questions. Um, I'm sorry, I, I, there's somebody who had a question earlier on. But uh, yes? You said that print hasn't gone away yet. And I remember, um, you know, we used to talk a lot about the digital divide. I haven't heard much about that yet um, or lately. One of the questions I have is, do you recommend that employers um, who want to reach markets still use newspaper ads to advertise their positions? OK, newspaper ads for employment? Yes. Employment ads. It depends what kind of uh, employee you want. If you want an employee who reads newspapers, <laughs> <laughs> I, would say, I would say it's valid. I will actually use the readership numbers. And uh, a lot of times, a lot of those buys buy you both, yeah. you know. So you look at the, uh, you know, the, the cost is minimal usually. And so you say, yeah, put it, put it both online and physical and print. But I would, I would definitely try it. Some people do. You do see people out in a coffee shop with newspaper there. So it's the old way of doing things. Who buys a house anymore circling the Sunday paper that you buy sort of the morning in Super America so you can get the early version with the, with, you know, I've done that back in the day. Today you don't do that, you just go online, so. Yes. Rico, I'm just curious, do you see any distinguishment between Hispanic and Latino? Hispanic and Latino is a great um, question, age-old question, and the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> in the Hispanic marketing, we speak interchangeably. Hispanic, Latino, Latino, Hispanic. In the Latino community, people prefer to use Latino in general. For example, we speak about Hispanic marketing. We have a Hispanic marketing conference. We use about the word Hispanic that way. But when we get our client to come, come to an event, the Latino community, and if I'm writing the speech, I will say, I'm glad to be here in the Latino community. So Latino is a little more um, uh, politically correct. Hispanic, you know, so many people have, oh, Hispanic is a term by the government, they came up with it for the census, ta, ta, ta. So, you know, this is a little more like politically incorrect, slightly. But in Hispanic marketing, many times we actually intentionally use it every other time. So I have a paper, say a thousand word little article. The first mention, it says Hispanic. The second mention, we say Latino, Hispanic. Just kind of randomly use half and half. Are there, are there certain cultures that identify with those terms more? I mean, I've always heard Hispanic is referring to Mexican culture and Puerto Ricans more refer to themselves as Latinos. Right. They don't really cross that. Right. I had a client uh, who is Chicano, which means, uh, I mean, not, not everybody who was born here is Chicano, but anyway, he's from Texas and he identified as Chicano primarily and uh, living in Dallas and um, he's, best language, you know, he was an um, English dominant Hispanic. He spoke English a lot better. His Spanish, his Spanish was sort of not very good. And that's why he relied on me. And he would read what I wrote in Spanish, but many times he wouldn't, wouldn't understand words. And then when I use the word Latino, he says, 
No, no. Yeah, ricos Latino. Rico Latino, ¿sí? Ricos Latino. But I'm Hispanic. You know, if I have to choose those two, I'm Hispanic, I'm not Latino. So some people have that attitude. Then I showed him the ultimate Chicano, Mexican-American, Edward James Olmos in L.A. <laughs> from the barrio. And he comes up with a book called Latinos in the U.S. The, La Vida Latina, Latina, Latino Life in the U.S. It's like, here. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's fine. It's both. Both are okay to use. But Latino in some ways, although again, Latino is masculine. It's not gender inclusive. So what do we do? We put an X. We put an at, Latinat, Latinx. Uh, so that is not uh, only uh, speaking about Latino men, Latino males. So, Hispanic, in some, that sense, Hispanic is gender neutral, which is nice, gender inclusive. Sometimes I like Hispanic for that reason, if the context is right. I've noticed, especially with millennial markets, Latinx is can we, can we the, even more... With millennials, yes. The question was about millennials. Yeah, you can raise your hands and we can do a yeah. microphone. With millennial women, yes, that's, that's the ones, they are the ones who are using. I showed, um, I showed you um, Maria I, uh, Isa, okay, big time. But with millennials, uh, Latinx, Latin, yeah, it's very, it's very, very common. It's the only thing we use in our marketing. Right, yep, exactly. No, that's, um, that's what a lot of my clients are using in terms of, in ter instead of the word Hispanic even. Hey, Rico, what, before we wrap this up, what, why, don't we, why don't we wrap this up? How about the cost of doing your marketing in these communities? We, we're focusing on Latino, obviously. We can't do all three of them and do them justice in, in an hour. So we focus on Latino. Give us an idea about you know, what, what the costs are for doing a, a marketing uh, strategy in the Latino market compared to the general market, obviously. Right. We'll end up with that. Right, OK. The cost of doing um, Hispanic marketing as opposed to general marketing. I would say they're about the same. I come from Latin America. We have high inflation there, so it's costing more and more all the time. <laughs> but no, just kidding. It, it's really very similar. You know, the planning that you do is uh, a little more micro-marketing planning. You know, it's not, um, although again, today, who does general market work? anymore anyway you still define you have to define exactly who you want you slice so in many ways it's very similar a lot of the, the the techniques and the strategies that you use to to do marketing today uh, uh, you will need for hispanic in fact i wrote a paper which i'm glad to email you to just mention that if you would like to receive it it's called the four r's of marketing uh, so it's a reaction to the four p's of marketing you know and i've seen the fifth P of marketing so many times, people, the, the one I liked the best was plaintiff. It was advertising, an advertising law uh, <laughs> presentation. The fifth P of marketing, plaintiff. And uh, so, but the four hours of marketing, the idea is that if you do good Hispanic marketing, it'll help you do good general marketing because it'll put uh, disciplines that you will need to develop and exercise to fine tune into a specific micro market to increase relevance. Yes. Okay. So yeah. maybe a, 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 an add on to that is there's always a conversation on whether or not it should be translated. Yes. And Don't translate. Never translate. If you hear the word translation, translator, uh, red flag, call Rico Latino. <laughs> My business card reads trans creator, a creative transfer. And that's what's needed. You know, you don't translate. Translating advertising is like translating a joke. It just doesn't work. But should you do it at all? Tra you know, should, can, you, can you approach, and, and I think you answered. Increasingly, maybe. yes. Okay. Increasingly, you can decide, you can define uh, creative, ex creative concepts. That, that, you know, you, they say that you have a creative team and you come up with three great concepts. Maybe one or two of them will travel better across cultures and languages than the other one. And sometimes only one of them does. You know, if you're thinking, you're thinking, okay, I'm thinking of various cultures, minorities in the U.S., African-American, Asian-American, immigrant cultures, Latinos. And then uh, at that point, early on in the process, you, you go for something that works for most people. Sometimes you can't, and you have to do separate uh, communications. Can have one more, Rico, then we have... One more question, yes. Uh, yeah, thank you, Rico. My name is Isa Mansari from the Africa People. My question is... What you have been talking about the multicultural advertising and all the rest. What about the penetration rate in terms of 
reaching the professionals in this community. Uh, for example, you want to reach lawyers, you want to reach um, market experts, you want to reach CEOs. What is the market penetration? How do you get that penetration? Yes, uh, you avoid the waste that happens when you blanket the whole Hispanic community, for example, or the whole African immigrant community or whatever in a given geographic area, whatever you're targeting. And you work much more through relationships and in increasingly through established, net, established networks. Ten years ago, I remember speaking in this conference about the emergence of the Latino professional class. Well, guess what? We have the minority professional class here. Like I said, first generation college educated, first generation professional in their families. So we have established groups of people that they get together to network business and working, a lot of suits and nicely dressed people from all ethnicities with their business cards. I tell them never show up with less than 20 business cards to, uh, to anywhere you go. Always have business cards on you and network, network. So there are tons of those groups. And if, for example, I'm much, much more aware of Hispanic in this town, but you can find them uh, in, in all African immigrant. They're, they're, we have chambers of commerce. We have other groups ad hoc in, in, in the Latino community, we have national groups with very active local chapters. We have a um, Latino Bar Association in Minnesota, the Latino lawyers, the MBAs, the professional engineers. We have chambers of commerce that come and go. And so uh, there are ways to do it, but you work through the relationships and through organizations. You may be able to sponsor the organization and get your message in the regular communications. Increasingly, a blog, a newsletter, their website, maybe be a, buy a table at the gala every year. So hey, thank you, Rico. We, we have to move on, folks. But on behalf of Rico Vallejos. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.